Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this year's celebration of Women's History Month with Dr. Lena Maria Murillo. The title of her presentation today is Demographic Fears and the History of Reproduction in the Midwest. I'm Janet Weaver, curator of the Iowa Women's Archives. And before we, want, we start, I want to thank our co-sponsors the Iowa City Public Library, and the UI Council on the Status of Women. And I also want to introduce our staff from the Iowa Women's Archives. Back in the back there is Women in Politics archivist Kate Razum, and over there on the left, Collections archivist Meredith Kite, and our wonderful graduate student assistants Beatrice Kearns and Kelly Kemp. So this year, the Iowa Women's Archives is 32 years old. Founded in 1992 through the vision and generosity of two amazing Iowa women, Louise Noun and Mary Louise Smith. And I'm delighted to see that the IWA's founding curator, Dr. Karen Mason, is here with us today. It is in large part due to her remarkable insight as a scholar of social history that the IWA has such a broad range of collections that together chronicle the lives of Iowa women in all their diversity. I want to acknowledge Karen for her dedication to the mission of the IWA. You know, archives don't just happen. They are built by years of painstaking work Today, the rich collections preserved in the IWA are tapped by scholars and students engaged in research and writing that situates Iowa, the Midwest, and women at the center of how we understand and interpret US history. They bring their gaze to our collections, some of which were brought into the archives 30 years or more ago, where they have patiently awaited their scholars. So you can imagine it was with great pleasure that I noticed Dr. Murillo making frequent trips to the IWA, bringing her students and delving into materials that I'm pretty sure had lain dormant for decades. We are delighted to have her here for this year's Women's History Month event. Dr. Murillo is Assistant Professor of Gender, Women's and Sexuality Studies, History and Latina OX studies at the University of Iowa. She completed her doctorate in Borderlands History at the University of Texas at El Paso in 2016. Her scholarship centers on the history of reproduction and race in the US, including the history of the birth control movement, abortion, immigration, eugenics, and race, in, in the, and population control. Her first and very soon to be completed manuscript 
is under contract with University of North Carolina Press, and she tells me it's coming out in December this year. Congratulations. Since joining the faculty of the University of Iowa in 2018, she's broadened her analysis to examine how the potential for demographic change has affected the legal and social environment for obstetrical care in Iowa and the Midwest. Professor Murillo is the author of numerous articles, scholarly publications, and op-ed pieces, and recipient of the 2023 Catherine Stimson Prize for Outstanding Feminist Scholarship. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lena Murillo. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to thank especially uh, Janet and Anna Holland um, at the Iowa Women's Archive for their incredible support um, and for um, allowing me to bug them, <laughs> I feel like, every other month um, asking questions about these collections. And it is truly my honor to be with all of you here um, to celebrate Women's History Month. So today's presentation is part of a larger ongoing project on the politics of abortion in the United States um, at the intersections of reproduction and population control. And for today's talk, and, and really for um, much of, of what I hope becomes a book, um, I really want to focus on the Midwest. Uh, so I look forward to your comments and your, your questions. Um, at the end of the talk. But for now, please gaze upon our first image here. This is from a film called Zero Population Growth. It was a 1972 Danish film. Um, it was a dystopic science fiction that was inspired by the best-selling novel, The Population Bomb by Paul Ehrlich. Um, the film is concerned with the overpopulation of future Earth quote, whose global world government executes those who violate a 30-year ban on having children. It was film, filmed in Denmark, and the film is almost entirely set-bound, featuring art direction designed to reflect a bleak, oppressive future. And as you can see, smog covers the earth. The oxygen is depleted. Love is encouraged, but the penalty for birth is death. So just to set the scene, it's slightly dramatic. Um, and so my, at this point, and I know some, there's a few Midwestern scholars amongst us here. Um, right now, for me, the Midwest is really just Iowa and Wisconsin. So if anyone is interested in, in knowing beyond that, uh, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just getting my, my bearings. Um, as, as Dr. Weaver said, I am a historian of the U.S.-Mexico borderlands but I, I'm giving it a go. Um, and I have some very wonderful scholars and colleagues and dear friends who are helping me along the way. So our story starts in Wisconsin. It was in July 1969. Robert West, professor of chemistry at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, wrote to his colleague, Garrett Hardin, professor of biology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, asking about abortion. Professor West had concluded that something urgent needed to be done about the problem of overpopulation, likely to cripple the planet and its inhabitants in the decade, in the coming decade. West wrote, quote, even if the famine which looms over much of the world can be avoided, and I don't think it can, the exponential increase in numbers will, I believe, profoundly change human society. After reading Hardin's recently published book, Population, Evolution, and Birth Control, Wes reasoned there might be a way out of this man-made catastrophe. Wes explained that, quote, a change in attitude toward abortion is crucial, for with present technology, it seems that population stabilization cannot be achieved without the use of abortion to back up birth control measures. Hardin certainly agreed with West's perspective on the issue of abortion and population control. Hardin had spent the better part of the 1960s writing openly 
about the need to liberalize abortion laws across the country as one of the most important pillars in the fight to, quote, population stabilization. Hardin's article, The Tragedy of the Commons, became a critical text in extending Thomas Malthus' thesis that exponential population growth was untenable on a planet whose natural resources would soon be depleted. Now, Hardin and West were part of a longer lineage of academic scientists growing concerned since at least the 1950s about a world population out of control. The late 1960s, however, saw a marked upswing in calls by many scientists demanding that the greater public take this issue seriously. Paul Ehrlich's now infamous The Population Bomb, along with Hardin's The Tragedy of the Commons, were both published in 1968. By the 1970s, the country was enveloped in combating what seemed like the most pressing issue of their time, overpopulation. And many believed that the surest solution to what West called, quote, the most important long-range issue facing humanity was an expansion of birth control options, most centrally access to abortion. Now, as a scholar myself of reproductive justice, and I, I do want to say that this is different from reproductive rights, and I know that there are many people here who, who understand the difference, but just in case for, the, for those watching at home who don't know the difference, um, reproductive justice scholars believe um, in bodily autonomy, grounded in a human rights focus. Um, and this goes beyond sort of legal understandings of human rights, but just in our, our bodily autonomy as human beings on the planet. And so I come to this history from that perspective. I'm also a historian of abortion and contraception. And as I mentioned, my, my scholarship is most recently focused on the U.S.-Mexico border region. Um, and so these connections between anxieties for population control and birth control, I can tell you they're, they're not new, right? I mean, really my work along the U.S.-Mexico border shows that they stretch uh, to, to the 1920s and 1930s. And historians have been talking about this for some time, especially those who have focused on the long history of the family planning movement in the United States, especially the life and legacy of people like Margaret Sanger um, and Planned Parenthood Federation of America, They've conceded that uh, these movements um, and these histories have had long and troubled um, connections to population control and, and to eugenics, eugenics. And oftentimes, many of the people in those movements were one and the same. However, the history of abortion at the intersections of eugenics, population control, and demographic politics has not followed a similar introspective trajectory. And I'm happy to talk about that more during our Q&A. Um, but I do want to kind of talk for a brief moment about how I became interested in this particular study in the Midwest. Now, in 2022, when Roe fell, everyone and their mother, as they say, wanted to know what happened? Why are we here? How come we don't have um, our constitutional right to abortion? And IPR, some of you may know who those guys are, reached out to me and they're like, hey, you're a historian of abortion. Tell us why we don't have abortion in the United States anymore. And can you tell us the history of abortion in Iowa? And I was like, no, but I can find out. <laughs> um, and I did. And one of the first articles that um, I found was written by James Moore um, in 1989, who's a, kind of the godfather of, of abortion history um, in the 19th century. In fact, he wrote a book called Abortion in the 19th Century. And in it, he talks about um, the fact that uh, by about the, the 1890s, um, nearly every state in the United States had a law on the books um, criminalizing abortion access. Unless, I should always the caveat, unless it was performed in a hospital by a physician, right? And, um, and different states had sort of different um, legal codes. Some, like the state of Iowa, um, 
said no to abortion under any circumstances, not even to save the life of the mother or pregnant person, um, and, and not even in the cases of rape or incest. But again, this varied uh, state to state. And he was the only person that had written an article about abortion history in Iowa. And uh, I read his article, which was fabulous, and a lot of the sources that he used come from special collections, and some of them have now split off and are now in the Iowa Women's Archive. And he concluded at the end of his article that the reason why um, people had attempted in the late 1960s to push for liberalizing abortion laws in Iowa was due in part to population control almost overwhelmingly, actually. He's like, there's other reasons, like the doctors wanted it, and or uh, women, the women's movement, but really it comes down um, to concerns for population control. Now, again, let me take an even bigger sort of, uh, sort of step back and give you all a little bit of context for that period, so the na- late 1960s. Um, States like New York, California, and Colorado had already started to um, liberalize their abortion laws. Up until this time, many states, as I'd mentioned, had laws on the books curtailing access to abortion. Um, And in the 1950s and 1960s, um, there was a growing um, issue with fetal abnormalities Um, And this is especially true for women who had been given thalidomide um, to deal with morning sickness. And so this became kind of a a hot-button issue um, by about 1962, 1963. But again, really, there weren't a lot of people writing about it publicly in the way people like Garrett Hardin were. Um, There was a massive increase at that time as well of underground abortion referral services. I've written extensively about that history along the U.S.-Mexico border, but many of you may have heard of the Jane Collective in Chicago, right? So not just underground uh, abortion referral services, but actually people offering abortion services, right? And so what I'm hoping to do um, today, really, in my talk is to kind of connect these conversations around population control and demographic fears um, to this sort of deep connections to abortion rights and abortion movement, and to show how some activists in the movement exploited women's concerns for reproductive liberation and reproductive health care to push forward a population control agenda and really in the, in the Midwest, right? So some of you may know the Des Moines Register. So they take a survey in 1970. They take this poll of residents across the state of Iowa, confirming that, quote, overpopulation was the greatest fear as a new decade began. Three-fourths of adults in Iowa, quote, worried about the possibility that the world population might double in the next 40 years. A majority of Iowans believe that family planning, education, and birth control were key to averting global catastrophe. Iowans were not singular in their concerns about overpopulation. Other states in the region, including Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana, were similarly vexed by the issue of what to do about overpopulation. And, you know, when I started reading some of this uh, and, and James Moore's article, I was, I was flummoxed. Why in such a rural state are people this panicked over overpopulation? The fixation on overpopulation in a historically rural state like Iowa just did not seem to add up for me especially given sort of recent, very recent um, legislative analysis of demographic data in Iowa, concludes that, quote, Iowa has long been a slow-growing state. While the U.S. population more than doubled between 1950 and 2010, Iowa's population grew by a minuscule 16%. As I began to dig through the same archives that Professor Moore had looked through decades before, 
I noticed that those who opposed abortion liberalization in Iowa acknowledged fears about overpopulation as they simultaneously touted the growing loss of Christian values and moral decay that would surely besiege their state if abortion laws became less restrictive. As debate over abortion heated up in Iowa beginning in 1969, constituents wrote hundreds of letters to their legislators declaring these concerns. One Des Moines, um, Iowa resident exclaimed, quote, we can talk about overpopulation and other ills, but to correct one wrong with another is idiotic. Another resident, this time from Waterloo, Iowa, wrote, quote, what happens to the morals of a country when a person can decide if he is to kill an unborn baby or not? What has happened in Russia or in Sweden? A Black Hawk County couple pleaded with legislators to, quote, please, in the consciences of motherhood, Americanism, and humanism, vote no to loosening abortion laws in Iowa. In attempts to halt further discussions about abortion access, Iowa residents, some of them, evoked this new holy trinity of motherhood, Americanism, and humanism in the name of protecting Iowa's morals and values from the decadent path taken by these so-called communists and socialist countries, right? So connecting these seemingly disjointed concerns for demographic change, nationalism, motherhood, anti-communism, and the preservation of fetal life against liberalizing abortion in the Midwest, a lot of this is part of a still nascent anti-abortion movement that wouldn't really come to sort of bloom until after Roe v. Wade, but we sort of see in the archives um, these folks starting to write and to think as a somewhat coherent religious um, group. And historians Carissa Hageberg, who's actually a graduate of the University of Iowa History Department, um, and my other dear colleague Jennifer Holland, suggest in a research on pro-life activists, um, these disparate messages were part and parcel of ideas deeply connected to white supremacist machinations about the preservation of white life, beginning at conception, and I'm also arguing today the preservation of white space and place best immortalized in America's heartland. Now, by unspooling these historical threads that unite major changes in reproductive rights laws, we begin to understand how attitudes about the politics of demographic and population changes swelled white anxieties around American morality and culture. Demographic changes have, since at least the 19th century, produced anxieties about the racial composition of the United States that pull at central ideals undergirding white nationalism. Values uplifting ideas like frugality, hard work, responsibility, individuality, reason, respect, liberty, virility, and its control have been critical ideological components of white Christian racial formation in the United States. As coastal and borderland states quickly began to see massive and seemingly unbridled demographic changes in the 20th century, the U.S.'s imagined heartland became the last great space to preserve values and ideals whites felt were under attack. These anxieties became even more pronounced as the end of the civil rights era bled into the era of militant activism against the Vietnam War and for freedom struggles among black, Latina, and Latino, and indigenous communities, as well as the women's movement. And I owe much of my thinking about this to my beautiful and brilliant colleague, Dr. Howard, who's sitting right here. Shout out to you. Um, who is also writing an incredible book about violence uh, and black rebellion in the Midwest. Um, check that out. It's coming out the same press as mine. Uh, <laughs> um, but we've been thinking about these, um, about these, these things together, and I am, I'm very much indebted to her work um, in the Midwest. So in other words, in overwhelmingly white states such as Iowa and Wisconsin, Census data, this is just a little site, census data reveals that it was, that Iowa was 99% white in 1960 and 98% white in 1970. Wisconsin was 97% white in 1960 and 96% white in 1970. That these abortion debates were driven by different arguments in support of white supremacy that fundamentally derailed feminist demands for reproductive liberation. 
Here are my people. So I've been, I've been rummaging through their archives. Um, and so really, they're, they're, you know, the bulk of the material for this talk comes from the papers of, of Senator Minette Doder, Earl Willits, and Willia Charlene Conklin, who really spearheaded the movement for um, the liberalization of abortion laws in Iowa. Um, and I do, like I said, I'm focusing on Iowa and a little bit of Wisconsin, but I think Iowa is really fascinating because my borderland sort of framework, Iowa borders so many different states. Nebraska, again, shout out to Dr. Howard, South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Missouri, placing it at the literal center of the so-called heartland. And imagine white, bucolic, pristine, hearty, bountiful Christian oasis at the very core of the American nation. Its picturesque farmscapes live effortlessly in the minds of most white Americans envisioning their homeland. The second reason is that James Moore's article demonstrates Iowans deliberations over liberalizing abortion restrictions and just how perfectly preserved these conversations that people are having um, with each other and with their elected officials. They're just beautifully preserved, again, at the Iowa Women's Archive. Go check them out. Um, and as I read through hundreds of letters, and really, I should say, it's more like dozens and dozens of letters. What I found, I thought I had collected hundreds of documents, but I had not. I've just been sitting for hours reading these beautifully handwritten for my people who can no longer read penmanship. I highly recommend that you relearn this critical skill, or else you will not know what people said in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, because oftentimes people are rushing off these letters um, with extraordinary passion um, and concern for, for local politics, local and state politics, but it's all in penmanship. So, I'm, and I'm looking at my children. Um, this is a, a skill you all need to learn. <laughs> and most of the people that are writing um, their, you know, their, their senators um, are mostly white, coming from very rural areas of the state, mostly Christian and Catholic, offering justifications for um, allowing abortion restrictions to remain as they are or overturning them completely. And so these papers really become a window into the heart and soul of white Americans wrestling with differing definitions and visions of white supremacy. Should white supremacy concern itself with clamping down on a global, mostly black and brown population run amok, one that might eventually make its way to the heartland? Should Iowans discipline and control their own fertility as an example to others incapable of doing so? Or should white supremacy focus on protecting the moral fiber of America, life, liberty, property, and virility? These were not necessarily oppositional concerns. Rather, in the debate about abortion, they helped communities as well as the women and they helped shape these sort of, excuse me, uh, opposing viewpoints. And finally, Iowa's demographic reality could not have created a starker contrast to the residents, to its residents' fears. Both its racial composition and population density did not and still do not warrant the level of racial anxiety and animus created by the population explosion scares and abo uh, abortion disputes in the 1960s. Oh, some of you may recognize this, the Iowa Press Citizen shout out. Um, and yet in the spring of 1969, Iowa City's Press Citizen dedicated nearly all of its editorial page to the question of overpopulation with a headline blaring, how fast is the world growing? 72 million people yearly. Several articles accompanied the central um, overpopulation focus, including an analysis about the war in Vietnam and another article titled, quote, The New Face of Black Power. The juxtaposition of these other issues elevated and added gravitas to the overpopulation debate, debate happening on the page. The massive image that a uh, complemented these news stories, provided visual guidance to those on both sides of the abortion debate. 
Alarming to those already worried about overpopulation were the numerical figures and regional diagrams depicted in the image. The map revealed that near, nearby Central America held the fastest growing population in the world with Costa Rica leading the pack. In the following years, it would be Mexico that would take its place as the epicenter of overpopulation debates. Immigration fears and concerns of, quote, hordes of Latin Americans spilling across um, the border had been a consistent concern for white Americans since the early 20th century. Overall, the largest contributors to the overpopulation problem, those having the most babies, were Africa, Asia, and Latin America, continents considered to house all of the world's developing nations. The Press Citizens editor cited University of Iowa, oh, here we go, Etym etymologist Hugh Dingle's main issue that, quote, millions die now in the world of causes related to starvation and that what is occurring now is that temporary expedients to ease the problem of starvation are only producing more people to starve later. Dingle estimated that easing poverty via food programs to those in the so-called third world was backfiring on the first. Rather than aid emerging nations during the post-colonial period, after Europe and the United States had essentially bankrolled their industrialization um, in these sort of uh, in these areas and had exploited and expropriated land um, and labor in Africa, Asia, and Latin America the developed world was in danger of being overrun by explosive third world populations. The editors concluded that the doubling of the world's population would undoubtedly double, quote, human suffering around the globe. Don't worry, Iowa, Wisconsin's in here too. Similar articles ran in Wisconsin newspapers that foresaw an overpopulation apocalypse. For instance, in news articles from the Green Bay Press Gazette, editors believed it critical to write about the overpopulation problem in the Philippines and other Asian countries, explaining to the readership of one of Wisconsin's northernmost regions that the combination of overpopulation and underemployment were serious problems that faced Asia and perhaps even Green Bay's remote corner of the world. Manila, the capital of the Philippines, stood out among other Asian cities due to, quote, chaos of its crowds. These kinds of sensationalist articles surely influenced the thinking of these rural and out-of-the-way Midwestern cities and towns as they grappled with potential social unrest among the so-called colored masses at home while imagining the burgeoning so-called colored masses abroad. National organizations certainly played a role in framing the abortion debate in the Midwest around population control. And we have this organization. Do you remember that film, ZPG? Here we go. It was an actual organization. It gained traction with many Midwest residents in Iowa. In Iowa, there were several local chapters, including uh, Johnson County, Polk, Black and Black Hawk counties. In Wisconsin, ZPG appeared in various cities, including Stevens Point, Eau Claire, Wausau, La Crosse, and Madison. ZPG was the brainchild of our dear Paul Ehrlich, who's a Stanford biologist who had won acclaim and captured the world with his dire warnings of impeding civilizational collapse due to unmitigated reproduction. The leader of the Iowa City Johnson County's chapter of ZPG stated that they had received hundreds of inquiries from residents interested in joining, joining their 25-member group. In Cedar Falls, the local coordinator of the ZPG chapter, excuse me, Dr. Daryl Hoff, professor of earth sciences, declared that, quote, the threat of overpopulation has not gone away during this first year of our group's existence. The ZPG provided important framing for the movement for population control in Iowa, offering key policy points, such as, quote, supporting birth control programs for all citizens, increased contraceptive research, new abortion laws, wider roles for women, and tax laws to encourage rather than discourage smaller families. In Stevens Point, Wisconsin, the connections between population control and abortion were clear. And now you can see the clipping on the very end there. Um, 
please join us for Dr. George Becker, uh, his talk uh, from the biology department on abortion and the American female. The public is cordially invited to hear about this highly controversial subject. Now, as you'll know, most of the people I've talked to up to this point are men, right? I'll keep that. Let's keep that in mind. Um, as the story in Matthew Connolly notes, the Zero Population Growth National Organization believed that, quote, population control begins at home. Among its adherents were those who believed that the U.S. should install a penal code that, quote, called for the sterilization of parents with more than five children. Some in the family planning movement, like Dr. Alan Guttmacher, uh, who's uh, the president of Planned Parenthood uh, Federation of America, suggested that organizations such as ZPG were, quote, smokestream for something else, including white supremacy and anti-communism. And they were everywhere, I tell you. Even the, uh, even the Wisconsin Senate elections, this idea of zero population growth was everywhere. As candidates were asked to weigh in on important issues in Wisconsin, would-be Senator David Fries from Watertown, Wisconsin, answered a question about population, or, excuse me, about pollution, this way, quote, above all, we should recognize that pollution in the main is caused by having too many people in Wisconsin, in America, in the world. Therefore, we should strive immediately to accomplish <laughs> zero population growth. In other words, educational programs and, if necessary, economic inducements should be res resorted to so that people will understand that they have absolute responsibility to society to restrict the size of their families and prevent population growth. In Iowa, while legislators continue to discuss politics of liberalizing abortion laws, um, this eventually, right, and, and Wisconsin too, so Iowa and Wisconsin are very similar in this way, they debate this issue um, for many years until about 19, uh, 1972, it's in the legislature, but by the time they're gonna come back again in 1973, in January, we already have Roe v. Wade, right? But debate they did, and in fact, these are some of the messages from, um, from the, some of the constituents, mainly in the state of Iowa. Now, you won't be surprised to learn that Iowa residents agreed with, with media representations of overpopulation. Supporters of liberalizing abortion restrictions sent out countless letters to legislators connecting greater abortion access to ending overpopulation. Several Cedar Falls residents wrote in a telegram, quote, no one can argue that we don't have enough unwanted babies. Let us do now what we humanely can to reduce the present oversupply. We urge you to vote yes on the abortion bill and thus do your part to reduce the misery and unhappiness in today's world. Another Cedar Falls couple expressed a similar sentiment writing, quote, we believe that our society must realistically acknowledge and act on the population control measures to maintain a free and healthy society. We urge you to support prompt passage of the bill to liberalize the Iowa abortion laws. We should provide an opportunity for children not to be born into unwanted environments. An Iowa Falls resident wrote to Senator Manette Doder to express the following. Although American ethics seem to be against abortions, they are legalized in Japan, Mexico, and Sweden, and in many other countries. When one considers the population explosion today, I believe that abortion should be used similarly to birth control to prevent explosion, uh, explosive population growth. And I will add, um, they're wrong. Abortion was not legal in Mexico. But because so many people were crossing the border at the time to access underground abortion providers, there was this idea that it was legal in Mexico, and it was not. Now, by the following year, some legislators express agreement with their constituents as they lean into the varied arguments in favor, in favor of greater abortion access. Earl M. Willits, Democrat from Polk County in, Iowa, in the Iowa House, replied to a voter's inquiry about the proposed abortion liberalization uh, legislation this way. Quote, this seems to me the wise step to take at this time in light of the problems we face with unwanted children, women seeking illegal abortion, and overpopulation. Claims that there existed a, quote, 
oversupply of babies hearken to the discourses about the supposedly hyper, hyper fertility among women of color the world over and the deep need for expanding family planning campaigns, including access to abortion and sterilization. Now, of course, calls for liberalization of abortion laws in the name of overpopulation obscured the demands for better health care by reproductive age women in Iowa and the greater Midwest who had suffered immensely during this period of prohibition. What follows are excerpts from women who wrote dozens of letters to Senator Manette Doder, a representative from Johnson County. And as I stated earlier, I, I spent a lot of time reviewing these letters. Um, I was moved to tears by their content, their openness, their sincerity, their clarity. Because of special restrictions placed on what I'm about to talk about now, um, I cannot tell you the names of these constituents who wrote in to share um, their often traumatic and tragic stories, but I can share with you their words. A young mother living in Vernon, Iowa wrote, quote, I feel this is a very important thing, and I hope it will be brought up again this session. The more realistic and up-to-date law would certainly be a vote of confidence for every woman, she said, of the 1969 attempts to change Iowa abortion laws. And at the time, like I said, there was no exception for rape or incest, or to save the life of the mother. That's all they were trying to do in 1969, which just merely add those caveats to the law, right? So very low stakes. And, and the Iowa legislator, legislature went against it. She continued, quote, I too carried a dead baby for several months and several years. And several years later, I had to have a hysterectomy from the damage this helped to do to my system. I just thank God I had my four children before this time, and they are normal and healthy. 30 years is too young for this type of surgery, she concluded. Others wrote from outside of the state to tell the senator to keep her movement going. Quote, I wish you much luck and pray for your successful efforts to do away with a ban on pr practically all abortions in your state. I wish, I wish too, you could give us some help down here with our own old laws. I have two beautiful girls, and not long ago had to have an operation and was told I shouldn't become pregnant. My doctor for many years said, my doctor for many years said he would tie my tubes and my husband and I agreed. But the hospital has a board of directors, in parentheses she puts, all men. And they, and she, underscored, and she underlined they, decided I couldn't have that done. They didn't even talk to me, just sat around a table and decided. I believe the decision was mine and, and my doctor's. Thank you for defending a woman's right to choose. These cases reveal the degree to which the lack of sound reproductive health care, due in part to an oppressive, racist, patriarchal medical structure, put women's lives and their reproductive futures at risk. While lack of proper abortion access sterilized the Iowa mother in the first case, the second mother detailed how a physician's board put her life at risk. And, and as a mother, I mean, imagine you accidentally becoming pregnant, as another uh, letter writer said, um, and, and leaving, knowing that you might leave your children behind, right? They put her life uh, at risk um, by denying her the ability to freely access tubal ligation. Access to, quote, having your tubes tied had become a racialized reproductive health procedure by this time while thousands of mostly black, indigenous, and Latina women across the United States were forcibly sterilized, often under medical duress, without their consent and the consent of their spouses, which was common at the time and shockingly to some still common today. White women were often denied tubal ligations if physicians deemed them still of reproductive age. 
So again, within this broader context, notions of population control laden with eugenic ideology frame the politics of abortion access specifically and reproductive care generally for women in the Midwest during this period. Other women wrote in to support Doder's campaign and simultaneously indicated the patriarchal system that kept them from flourishing as full human beings in a democracy. As one woman from Esterville, Iowa wrote, quote, my husband and I do not intend to have children. We are both teachers holding master's degrees. If I were to become pregnant by school policy, I would be forced to resign. I would be forced to resign my teaching positions, not given a leave of absence. It is unlikely that I would be rehired, an unwritten policy, until my youngest child was attending school full time. Under these conditions, I would do anything I could to get an abortion if I accidentally became pregnant, even to the point of going abroad. How much better it would be to be able to take care of it in a doctor's office without unnecessary publicity and inconvenience. Now let's remember, right, this is the 1960s when women's liberation movement was in full swing, but one that's often depicted as only occurring in the so-called urban centers across the United States. But even in the tiny rural town of Astorville, Iowa, I have to admit I had to look it up, um, two hours east of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and three hours south of Minneapolis, Minnesota, the two closest largest cities, women were asserting their human rights to bodily autonomy and dignity. And of course, she wasn't alone, right? So even as Senators Doder and Conklin, pictured above, um, received letters of support, they also received the most vitriolic and hateful mail. As I was saying earlier, trolls have been around for a long time, y'all. Um, but during this time, they actually had to sign their names and put their addresses. Um, and you couldn't, you know, they didn't go viral. Um, but still, these women received awful hate mail. Um, and these women, you know, they responded forcefully. In one especially un-Midwestern response, due to its piercing directness, Doder writes, in spite of everything, a legislator has to stand for all segments of society, not just the viewpoint of one group. This I have tried to do. I don't believe you understand the present changes. Would you be willing to carry a dead fetus for seven or eight months waiting for it to deliver itself? Iowa law says you must, and Iowa women have done just that. Would you be willing for a child dear, uh, for a child dear to you to bear the child if she had been raped by a criminally insane man? Doesn't that woman, doesn't the woman have any rights at all in your code? I don't think it is asking too much to allow the woman who is alive to have some individual conscience in this matter. Surely the law should treat her with as much compassion as it is willing to, to give to the fetus, she said. And yet, connections between bodily autonomy and reproductive liberation were consistently obscured by population control advocates, including activists in the Midwest. These relationships became all the more difficult to entangle when activists for population control were also supposedly championing expanded access for reproductive health care. In her book, titled Abortion is a Blessing, Wisconsin women's activists and Nicole Gaylor explain how Wisconsin's first abortion fund had been formed. Now, if you all remember, that's Robert West, who was writing to Garrett Hardin at the beginning of the talk. And she says in her book, quote, prior to the Roe v. Wade decision, Professor Robert West of the University of Wisconsin uh, uh, Chemistry Department, his wife Peggy and I were discussing a particularly sad situation where a young person uh, disadvantaged, needed to go to New York for an abortion. We should start a fund, Bob said, to help some of these women. Oh, Bob, I replied, that fund would always be running out of money. But we'd help some, he said. 
And so in 1972, the Women's Medical Fund was born and incorporated. And over the years, we helped more than 5,000 women. And this is about uh, when she's writing this book, it's about 1976. I should also say that Anne, Anne Nicole Gaylor also founded the first ZPG chapter in Madison, Wisconsin, before establishing the Women's Medical Fund, right? And this is, an, it, this is indeed true. Many of the abortion funds that some folks in this room, including myself, have likely supported, um, have various uh, kinds of, of ties, right, to these different organizations. Iowa's abortion fund has its roots uh, connected to the work of the clergy consultation service um, that started in the years before Roe, when mostly Protestant and Jewish clergy sought to help the parishioners seek clandestine abortion providers. Um, however, what's discussed last, uh, and, not ju and, and especially among historians of abortion and reproduction, um, but certainly among the wider public, is the deep-rooted history of population control fears that motivated the politics around the liberalization of abortion laws in the United States. Although anti-abortion activists bring up population control and eugenics all the time as a means to discredit the movement for reproductive freedom, including some Supreme Court justices, Clarice Thomas, I'm looking at you, sir, historians insist on downplaying these connections. And I believe we need to write much more grounded, honest histories, especially examining particular regions of the country and specific localities to understand how people were talking and thinking about abortion, demographic change, and population control as part of a singular narrative. Omitting these troubling histories does nothing to protect our rights to bodily autonomy. And not clearly in accurately discussing the politics of abortion history and the in, at the intersections of democracy and white supremacy in the United States has had major repercussions in the movements for reproductive liberation. Namely, that it has alienated communities of color who have experienced nefarious attacks on their bodies, namely through forced sterilizations, and in some cases, goading women into having abortions, and I urge you all to read the work of people like Alondra Nelson on the Black Panther Party in New York and the history of free clinics there, and Natalie Lida's work on sterilization abuses among Mexican origin women in California. We need to talk about these histories. We need to recognize within the abortion movement. There are deep ties to population control and eugenics, um, and, and, and frankly, um, oftentimes these histories were omitted because people were trying to protect Roe, but we could not protect Roe. And here we are. I have been, um, I have been saddened, is, is, is to put it lightly, to come to many talks um, here in, in this very room um, where people are talking about reproductive health care and abortion um, that are supposed to, me, you know, supposed to help carry this movement forward. And I cannot tell you, one, how gutting it is to not see young people in the audience, and two, not to see more people of color. And I do not blame, I do not blame those folks, right? Because we have been gaslighting them, we have been gaslighting our communities into telling them that their experiences are not valid. Right, that their experiences of population control and eugenics are not valid. And for your moment of zen, for those of you who understand that reference, Garrett Hardin, who I started with. Garrett Hardin is one of the founders of NARAL. Right? This is the national organization at this very moment, right, at the head of abortion, uh, defending access to abortion in the United States. Garrett Hardin, um, and this is, yes, as you read that, a, a Southern Poverty Law Center has said of him that, that he used the specter of environmental destruction and ethnic conflict to promote policies that can fairly, be fairly described as fascist. I have a dear colleague who writes about, um, about his work um, at the, um, with immigration policy in the United States in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, he was an ardent, 
xenophobe, uh, and was alive until 2003. Um, and a lot of uh, sort of returns to, or, or desires to return to a neo, what he called neo-Malthusianism, and neo-eugenics. He was trying to bring these ideas back. And this man is the founder, one of the founders of NARAL, right? Um, so thank you all very much for your time, and I look forward to your, to your questions. Thank you. I'm going to go back because I don't want to. I don't want to have him in my background. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Thank you so much, Lena. Sure, absolutely. That was amazing as well as so distressing. Sorry. And I think, the, but I think that we all have to learn from that and take it to heart and do what we can to bring these conversations more to light. Your work does that, um, and so thank you very much. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have time for questions, and if you have a question. Um, Meredith will go around with the mic. It's for, for them live streaming this, so you do need to use the mic. So yes, please. Thank you. Oh, sorry, everyone's like, oh. Yeah, <laughs> Hi, thank you, Professor, for being here today. Oh, no, thank you. Uh, a question I would have, it's a bit broad, but what would you like to convey to students, either in high school or in college, on what is the most pivotal role we can take in advocating for abortion access in our state, our community, wherever we feel we find ourselves? Well, one of the things that I, I try to tell students, and, and you know, I, one is that, like, join organizations that are already doing things, right? Uh, and there are. And as much as you can, um, try to take a reproductive justice approach mm. because it's going to, it's going to have, I mean, just force you to take a broader look at these issues, right? So for instance, um, I often get asked by uh, people in politics to help them think through like the reproductive health issues and they just want to come and sit down and talk about abortion. Mm. And I'm like, hey, we need to talk about the fact that there are huge maternal uh, health care deserts in the state of Iowa. And they're like, hmm. I'm like, these things are connected, right? If we're just thinking about not having enough physicians, right, not having enough ob guns, n people are leaving the state because they feel that they cannot provide complete reproductive health care that includes access to abortion, and it also includes prenatal care. Right, it also, right, like all of these things. So when we talk about how do we protect access to abortion, we need to say, how do we protect access to people wanting the health outcomes that they want, whether that is having healthy children or having access to an abortion, right? These things are part of that bigger picture. And so that's why I ended with that, like we need to read the scholarship of some of these folks who have been talking about how for women of color, right, for the most marginalized people in our communities, they have had a completely different experience, right? And they're like, I don't necessarily want to fight for access to abortion when I can't feed my kids. So like, how, how do we, right? So when somebody in the state who is a politician who shall remain nameless is saying, we're not gonna offer children um, summer, you know, summer food programs, that is a reproductive health, reproductive justice issue, right? Because you're making it impossible for poor families to help their children thrive, right? So if we're going to have conversations about abortion, then you need to come to the table to be ready to have conversations more broadly about justice, about reproductive justice, right? Yeah. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Hi, thanks. Hi. This isn't really a question because everything you said was so clear. <laughs> uh, but um, there was a really great, nicely written article in Politico this morning uh, about uh, you know the whole life begins at conception. That is not an old idea. And so no. some of the things that you said about people writing uh, and saying we you know oh life uh, this is, think of the fetus um, that was not universal at all. And that that art. I'd, 
anybody wants to read up more on this, it's a, it's a great little article in Politico. Yeah, and I think that that, you know, that they're, you know, they, we have wonderful, um, I mean, I hate saying it, actually. We don't have amnesia. We just don't teach history properly in this country, right? In fact, um, because we don't want people, we don't want an, an educated um, population. Um, but yeah, these are old, these are old hat arguments, right? Uh, and I think, you know, uh, Senator Doder said it so beautifully, right? When she's like, if you are going to um, demand that there be dignity for the fetus, can we also demand dignity for the person who's alive? Can, you know, like, can, can those two things, right? And so, um, but, but one of the things that I don't really talk about in, in my talk today that I'm really uh, engaging with um, more is, is the sort of changes in, in religion in the United States, right? And, um, and evangelical Protestantism and the way that it has, uh, you know, especially in the post row or I should say, after Roe v. Wade became law of the land, because I think post Roe means something else now. Uh, but after, you know, after 1973, um, and I highly recommend folks read um, uh, Jennifer Holland's Tiny You. It's such a great um, history of that movement. And, and also uh, Carissa Hagerberg's book. Um, they, re you know, they coalesce uh, in, in the most incredible way around the issue of abortion. And this notion of life begins at conception becomes their, their way of conceptualizing their own notions of population decline, um, really in sort of white supremacist terms, right? And so when they are talking about life beginning at conception, they're really talking very, very specific populations' life, right? They don't actually mean all people. They really just mean white evangelical Christian right? That's the life that they care about. That's the life that they seek to protect um, when, they, when they make those arguments. Hi, thank Hi. you. Um, I was just wondering if you could repeat some of the names of like the people that you would like recommend for reading or any other like names that are um, like books that you would recommend for reading more about like the history of reproductive rights. So I would highly recommend, I mean, really one of the sort of um, God, godmothers of the term reproductive justice is Loretta Ross, and you can find a lot of her writing on the, on the interwebs. Uh, she's prolific, so um, she's she's the founder of an organization called Sister Song, Black feminist organization um, that really helped to articulate right what I was saying the sort of broader understanding of, of reproductive justice. Um, Jennifer Holland and her book Tiny You, which I I just I love so much because. She really unfolds from, you know, she, she starts in the 1950s, but really shows how the movement gained steam after Roe v. Wade, after 1973. And then there's like a great primer, again, that's, that's written by, um, by Loretta Ross and Ricky Solinger called An Introduction to Reproductive Justice. And that does it all. It's like got a little bit of history, a little bit of like current activism, a little bit of like how do we understand this in the future. Um, so that, those are great, great books. Yeah. I think there was somebody in the, yes. I don't know if it's the, the online folks. It's just me, actually. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, I wondered, um, one thing I've noticed sometimes um, in terms of anti-abortion talking points is they'll use um, statistic, demographic statistics about um, abortion to characterize it as like a racial genocide of black Americans. Um, I wonder if you could talk about if you see any kind of connection between those histories and if antis have kind of uh, taken a rhetorical opportunity posed by these links between white supremacy and um, the movements for birth control and abortion access in the United States. And I, I think, thank you so much for that question. I think that question, and I think the, the ability for these anti-abortion activists to be able to do that is because, again, I think um, some of my colleagues who have written about the history of abortion have not wanted to, um, to sort of actually delve deeply into where those ideas come from 
or um, which I know uh, more recently by some, by some scholars of abortion have said, oh, really, we, we don't want those, some of those issues in the 1970s are not that big of a deal. Let's downplay concerns, for instance, by the Black Panthers, who were some of the people who were saying abortion is genocide, right? It, within the Black Panther Party, there were certainly black feminists who were like, this is actually a very chauvinistic male perspective from some of the people in our group. But like I said, if you go and you read some of the books like by Alondra Nelson, who I think is who you were asking about, um, she writes that in, in Harlem, in New York City, um, right after Roe, uh, black women and Puerto Rican women would go to these hospitals, these, you know, the general hospitals, the sort of uh, inexpensive, oftentimes free hospitals, um, to, to get care. They were pregnant and they, they wanted prenatal care. Um, and the physicians would immediately ask them, don't you want an abortion? And they would say, no, we don't want an abortion. Are you sure you don't want an abortion? No, I'm here because I have these other issues with my pregnancy. I'd like to keep my pregnancy, right? But those have become these like deeply embedded footnotes in the history of abortion and are not actually placed front and center. What is happening, right, among um, poor communities after Roe becomes law of the land? In some places, like in Texas, some women don't know one of the first um, post Roe v. Wade deaths is of Rosie Jimenez, who is a Chicana, who didn't realize that abortion was legal and went to see an underground abortionist um, and dies from a, a botched abortion, right? So we have these like very complicated legacies within communities of color, but we have not, we've not taken those histories seriously. Um, we've not done our due diligence as historians to really investigate why is it that we don't have a much more robust um, call for reproductive rights and access to abortion within those communities. And again, I, I, I'm saying it's because our relationship to that movement is one of a denial of our ability to have children. And so reproductive justice is much more capacious in that it says we have the right to have children, we have the right not to have children, and fundamentally we have the human right to parent our children in safe and sustainable communities. And so that um, definition, I think, allows us to be critical, rightfully so, right, of, of the current, I think, abortion movement um, that still does not take into account these histories. And allows the allows these conservative people to sort of spin these um, tales without us being able to actually say no. This is yes, this is deeply rooted in in racism. But what we know is that denial of access to all manner of reproductive care, starting with abortion, has adverse effects across the spectrum. Right for just basic access to health care. Um, kind of expanding on that, I the the end of reproductive justice that is the freedom to have children. I was wondering if you could speak more on the um, forced sterilizations that you mentioned earlier in the talk and how um, that connects to everything that we were just discussing with Kate's question. Yeah, I mean. It's, it's actually fascinating. I have a w wonderful dear colleague um, here uh, at the University of Iowa who's in a College of Public Health. She's a researcher, Nicole Novak, who actually did research in the state of Iowa on the, U the history of the eugenics board in Iowa. Um, and what she found is that, um, you know, the sort of ups, uh, highs and lows of sterilization change in different parts of the country. Um, so not every state in the United States had compulsory sterilization laws, but m many of them did. Um, Iowa was one of those states, North Carolina, California. Um, and in fact, next week, if you want to continue this conversation, uh, my dear colleague uh, Natalie Lida and Angela Hume are going to be giving a talk at, the, at Prairie Lights um, on their uh, books, uh, Natalie Lida's book, uh, Centers on the History of Sterilization Abuse from the 1920s. Um, really, I mean, into 2009, 
right? They're sterilizing uh, women in, um, in prisons in California. California has the largest women's prison in the world. I always tell people that, and they're like, what? It's wild. California was progressive in all of the wrong eugenic ways um, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and so they have the largest women's prison. And in 2009, um, uh, there were claims of women being sterilized um, in that prison. And uh, this is not, nothing to say of the sterilizations of, of detained migrants, right? So there was a case in 2016 at a Georgia detention center um, where women were being told that they had problems, um, reproductive health problems, and they were just going to get a little procedure done. And um, they didn't know what was happening to them. Um, and then months later realized that they had been sterilized again with again, without, without their consent. So that history remains alive, right? It's not history. It is our present day world. Um, but it just, it just kind of, you know, underscores that the people that are at the forefront of the denial of access to, repro to reproduce, to have children, to have families, are oftentimes women of color, uh, marginalized poor women, women in detention, right? So, so the histories of 100 years ago um, continue on um, because we have not, I think, thoughtfully dealt with the sort of racism, um, patriarchy, uh, and white supremacy at the, at the root of, of these attempts at, at reproductive control right, by the state. <gasps> oh my gosh, it's my child. They ask the hardest questions. <laughs> Um, my question is, is that on um, one of like the photos on yes. your um, slide, uh -huh. it um, if you looked, it said like seventy-two million like people born every year. Yes. But if you look to the left of that, it says. Um, I can go to that slide. This one. Yeah, but to the left of it, it says. Um, each day, uh, 331,000 babies are born. And then if you look again to the left, it says um, each second almost four babies are born. Um, but if you do the math, like... <laughs> if you I tell you, they ask the hardest question. I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't do the math. But if you do the math, um, each day, uh, 331,000 babies are born. If you do the math, like, there's 365 days in a year, and... <laughs> So, um, 331,000 times 365 is um, 120 uh, million. So, the math's yeah, not right. The math's not right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to look up uh, Professor Hugh Dingle and, like, ask him. I think, actually, he's passed away. <laughs> uh, what were you doing? Sam? Wow, mom, Your insensitive. Math is wrong. Um, yeah, and often, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, to answer your question, you know, oftentimes some of these calculations, and it's unclear from, from, from this, um, from the slide and, and, and from the actual, uh, article, um, how they were making these calculations, right? So, mm -hmm. like, are they, are they taking into account just people born? Because also in some of these areas of the world, there are high infant mortality rates, right? So like, yes, there are this many people born, but how many of those people make it to their first birthdays, mm. right? So, uh, so, so, you know, the math may not be mathing, but also there's these other things to take into, uh, into account um, as to why maybe the numbers are slightly skewed. But thank you for your question. Thanks, Mom. Love you. Yeah, love you. <laughs> Do we have a chat? No? It's not. It's not you. Okay. <laughs> and then I'll remember you, too. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is a question from uh, Donald Baxter, oh, wow. um, who says, uh, I was a board member of the Georgia chapter of NARAL in the 1980s and 90s and had the history of birth control and legal abortion brought up by the opposition. How do we answer this? This is very unfortunate. It seems to cut off. I can't see all of it. But um, Donald, if you're with us still, maybe you could try uh, finishing the last part of your 
question, but I think it's basically like how do we respond to Absolutely. that being brought up? Absolutely. And I think that I think that we we need we we are constantly on the defensive and not on the and not playing offense. Right. And we need to we need to articulate. I'm assuming we're all in the we articulate what we are what we're demanding, right, as a sort of vision for what reproductive liberation really means. Right. So, for instance, um, in the state of Iowa, if if the intent is to do away 100 percent with abortion, we're going to get rid of it. We won't allow it. Great. How are you going to help people have safe and healthy pregnancies and help them with having resilient, beautiful families and babies? How are you going to do that? What is your plan? Right. Show us. Where is the health care policies? Where are the educational policies? Where are the food policies? Where are the clean drinking water policies? Show us your plans for how you expect us to have, forcibly have, children in safe and sustainable communities, right? And so I think that we, we have to say, like, okay, you want to do this thing. What is your full plan? For when, because, because it is happening, right? Like if you look at a state like Texas, they are having more, more people are giving birth. It is just what's happening, right? And yet they are cutting at every, you know, at every uh, available um, opportunity, every single kind of social safety net, right? So, so what is their plan? What is their plan? And that's, that's where they fail, right? That's where they have no plan. And so to me, it's like, we need to start to think more holistically as a movement. And again, not to keep harping on it, but reproductive justice, I really does. I really do think that as an organizing kind of framework really will allow us to begin to ask those kinds of questions, right? And it'll help our movements unite. It helps our movement unite with folks dealing right now um, with anti-trans legislation, with, uh, with environmental justice uh, movement with um, with welfare and and right to food movements, right? Like these kinds of movements, all need to be united because we're essentially demanding very similar um, things at just various sides of the spectrum, right? Thank you so much, and thank you, thank you Donald. He did add on. So, uh, do we say like that was then and this is now in terms of these specific legacies of um, eugenics within the movement? I, I think what we need to do now is is begin to open up the movement so that that then that was then and this is now doesn't become the now again right so that we don't can keep repeating that old story right we need to do a little bit of that sort of introspection that I was saying and say why do some of these movements in some of these places remain so white what does that say about our movement? Because oftentimes what I hear from activists, especially some of my elders, and I say this with all due respect, is that you're like, those people just aren't interested. They don't want to come to this movement. They, it's like, no, no, right? We need to do some real deep soul searching about why it is that communities of color are not more involved, right? And how it is that we, that we need to pivot the movement to address the issues of their communities, of our communities, right? Did you have a question? Um, so you already answered some of these questions before, but I just kind of wanted to dive deeper into a sense of like how dangerous is it for women to be divided in reproductive justice in like a future sense and now? And what can we do to bring women from all backgrounds, so race, ethnicity, sexual orientation and gender identity to a common ground of all women's safety. And this kind of goes with what you were just talking about mm -hmm. um, with different cultural backgrounds yeah. as well. And I, I'll just say, you know, it's, <laughs> we're here. Like it's so, it's dangerous. We lost Roe, right? Like that was like, that was the sort of big, um, that was the big, the big threat and it's gone, right? Um, but again, taking a, a reproductive justice stance, we would say it was never really available. Access to abortion really wasn't available to all people, 
Um, you had the Hyde Amendment, right, just a few years after Roe. That made it so that poor people made it exponentially more difficult for poor people to get access to reproductive health care, right? So, like, it, it, it hasn't. It, you know, even as people try to protect, and this is, a, this is the kind of divide among some of, um, some of the activists uh, in that, that era of the movement is that they, they sort of prided themselves so much in protecting Roe that they kind of lost sight of these bigger, these bigger issues, um, the fact that um, there's an increase in, in the privatization of, of health care um, in this country, that the majority of the people in this country are in debt either because of student loan debt or health care debt. I mean, all of these questions have been constantly put to aside by the movement, um, and they need, to, they need to be folded in, right? We need to have these broader discussions. And this is what's going to make um, the, the collective of folks rallying together um, more diverse and much more grounded in people's everyday lived experiences and realities, right? Because as we know from some of these histories, wealthy people will always have access to abortion. All they need to do is get on a plane and go, right? These, these kinds of policies and laws will rarely, if ever, affect um, wealthy people. Um, and so... That's what's dangerous, right? It's about that's what's dangerous to women um, and to and to all and to all reproductive people. Um, that means all of us, all of us. Um, we all have a you know we all have stakes in this game. Whether you have a uterus, whether you are capable of, of carrying children or not, um, it is it is your duty as somebody who cares about um, the people around you. If you care about humanity, um, that you care about this, you know, about our about our bodily autonomy that is central to democracy. Oh my gosh! Now I'm getting preachy. All right, sorry. <laughs> you guys know this. Um, I know it's so late. It's almost six. We don't have to stay here till six, unless there's like other burning questions. Oh, you're, there's one more online. <laughs> Yes, we have one more um, from the chat, sure. which is, how do we get an equal protection solution? That is to say, private. we were always told privacy was shaky grounds. So yeah. I think a legal framework question. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that people are trying to do is to pass the Equal Rights Amendment again. I mean, or not again, but they're reinvigorating the movement for the Equal Rights Amendment. And again, I'm just... Midwesterners, man, Phyllis Schlafly from Illinois, she did a salad um, in the 1970s by really derailing that. And for those of you who don't know who Phyllis Schlafly is, she was the, um, I mean, she, she was really kind of spearheaded um, the anti-ERA movement. She was one of the um, sort of thinkers about cre uh, help create the anti-abortion movement in all of its kind of... Um, all of its grandeur. I mean, this woman was she was she was incredible uh, organizer, um, conservative uh, organizer again from Illinois. Um, but I think the, the ERA would be a critical first first step um, legally. Um, but I'm not a legal historian, so um, I think right now what people are trying to do is to protect it at a state level because that's what the Supreme Court said we needed to do. Um, but, of course, we don't know what will happen in 2024. Um, there are whispers of a national ban, right? So, um, so the state-by-state the state state kind of uh, um, vision now is, is in some way sort of putting a Band-Aid on the issue. We don't know what will happen in 2024. I wish I had a better answer other than, you know, like get the ERA back. But given the way that the Senate and the House are divided right now. I don't know. This is not a question, but I just wanted to share that uh, Donald remembers Phyllis. I don't know on a personal <laughs> level or Donald as a public like, figure, but yes. we, uh, yeah, we have a Phyllis knower in the audience. Oh, she again. She, I mean, she, this is one of these people. She's, you know, she straddled that that period from the 1970s into the um, into the early 20th century. I mean, she was really, and, and she's sort of fallen off of people's radars and now people are like, oh, I can't believe so many women are anti this. I'm like, 
Phyllis Schlafly. I mean, she she was a, she was a, an incredible. You have to credit where credit is due. She's an incredible organizer, um, and really rallied um, women across the country um, to vote against the ERA and to vote to to be to really um, kind of become awash in these conservative ideologies and and to push against push back against um, you know the women's movement in the United States. All right, y'all, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for your patience and your questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you.